Okay, I think uh, it's six o'clock, so we're going to get started. So first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming and taking the time to attend this uh, presentation on the restructuring sovereign debt in the uh, 21st century. It's a great pr pleasure to host this program. Uh, as you can see, this is hosted by the Rock Center for Corporate Governance, which is a joint center between the law school and the business school. And today we have a, a very uh, interesting presentation because we have both the legal side and the uh, finance side of the question on restructuring sovereign debt. So I think it's very special and it's part of our mission at the Rock Center to present these uh, topics, although I would say that sovereign debt is not traditional at the Rock Center here at Stanford. Uh, you know, we do a lot of the, the, the venture capital and startups uh, and, and, and sovereign debts is a bit more New York centric, but it's still incredibly important. And for us, it's, it's great to have uh, Lee Bukite, who is a senior partner at Cleary Gottlieb, probably the law leading lawyer uh, in the country and the world probably on this topic. So it's great that, that he, uh, he can come to Stanford and do this presentation. We had him about six years ago in the Eurozone crisis. So that's the last time. So every time there's a crisis, uh, uh, it ten tends to, to come here and talk about these sovereign debt issues. And so um, it, it's great that uh, we can have this presentation. The format is going to be, he's going to talk for 30 minutes. And then Professor Eber uh, is going to talk uh, from his paper. He just wrote a paper on the topic, and, uh, uh, which, which analyzes the value of equities and how they're affected in the specific case of Argentina. So this will revolve about in the case of Argentina. And so we'll have 30 minutes, 15 minutes. And at the end, we're going to leave 15 minutes for Q&A. And hopefully, we'll have uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, questions from the audience and make it a very uh, a memorable event. So with that, Lee, I'll leave it to you. Great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Friends, it is wonderful to be with you. Great pleasure to be back. Sovereign debt restructuring in the 21st century. There's likely to be a lot of it. <laughs> Here's the situation. We have come off, we are coming off, a period <clears throat> in which there have not been too many emerging market sovereign debt crises for two reasons. One is we've had the confluence of historically high commodity prices and historically low interest rates. And for emerging market countries, at least commodity exporters, of course, that is the perfect environment. If one or the other or both <clears throat> begin to unwind, and they are both beginning to unwind, uh, that will push a number of emerging market countries uh, to the wall. Uh, moreover, you've seen probably 20 emerging market countries, most of them commodity exporters, who, who have taken advantage uh, of this uh, uh, boom in the commodity markets to issue sovereign bonds for the first time in their history. Uh, those sovereign bonds are typically bullet repayments, meaning that the full amount of the principal is due on a certain day, three, five, seven years down the road. Uh, it is fatuous to think that the politicians in these countries are actually squirreling the money away to pay the bond when it matures. In fact, what they're doing is uh, assuming that when it matures, they will be able to refinance it from the market. And that assumption uh, presumes that uh, 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 commodity prices will be where they are and that there will be no other shocks, uh, political or economic or financial. All sovereign debt restructures in the last 40 years have operated Under this chemistry, each time a sovereign debtor enters a negotiating room with its creditors, each of them comes to that table with a unique strength and a unique vulnerability. <clears throat> the strength of the creditors in that negotiation rests in the fact that there is no shadow of chapter 11 that stretches over a sovereign. 
uh, sovereigns are not subject to a bankruptcy code, not their own, not anybody else's. Uh, the result is that a creditor can enter a negotiating room uniquely with a sovereign debtor and look at the debtor and say, son, uh, if you don't pay me, I can get a judgment against you. There is no protection of the bankruptcy code for you. Of course, a corporate debtor can sit there with the realization that if things get too sticky, uh, they can run to Chapter 11. It's not pleasant for the debtor. It isn't pleasant for the creditors. So that is the unique strength of a creditor entering the room and the unique vulnerability of a sovereign debtor. On the other side, the sovereign will say, you may get a judgment. That judgment will convey to you an emotional satisfaction. <laughs> it will not convey to you a financial satisfaction unless you can find assets of mine against which you can levy, you can seize. And I tell you now, there are no such assets outside of my country, the Republic of Ruritania. And what is outside, the embassies, the consulates, they are clothed by international law, by US law, with a special immunity. So read my lips. Get your judgment. And you will look for years, for decades, trying to find a way to satisfy. So now we sit at this negotiating table. It is true, I'm uniquely vulnerable to having a judgment taken out against me, but you are uniquely vulnerable to not having it paid. So that is the chemistry that all sovereign debt restructurings in the last 40 years have operated on. It changed rather dramatically starting in 2011-2012. In December of 2001, the Argentines defaulted on what was then the largest sovereign debt default in history, about 85 billion US dollars of bonds. <coughs> they attempted to restructure that debt stock only uh, in 2005, an extraordinarily long period to go, uh, they uh, got only 76% of the creditors to go along. The Argentines believed in this theory of telling creditors that they either participated in the debt restructuring or they would be consigned to the outer darkness of perpetual payment default. Uh, all sovereigns will implicitly threaten that, uh, but the Argentines did it explicitly. Not only did they put it in the prospectus for offering these new bonds, Had they had their way, they would have paraphrased Dante and put on the front of the prospectus, abandon hope, all ye who do not enter here, who do not accept this deal. Not only did they do that, they did something that no one else has ever done before. They passed a law known as the Lock Law, which forbade the Argentine government from ever paying or settling with any holdout creditors. That is, those who did not participate in the restructuring. So in effect, they said, you either accept this or you will never, ever, ever get paid. And that began a test of this theory that I spoke of a moment ago, that a sovereign would say, I'll never pay you. Uh, and the creditor would say, I'm going to resort to my legal remedies, and it would go on for years. In fact, that's exactly what happened. Uh, uh, many of these creditors were extraordinarily sophisticated and well capitalized. They brought lawsuits in New York, they got judgments, and they roamed the world. Uh, 
uh, looking for Argentine assets. There was no shortage of creativity <laughs> on, on the part of the creditors uh, to the point that the Argentine Navy has a sailing vessel that they use to train cadets of the Argentine Navy. When I say sailing vessel, I mean sailing. Horatio Nelson would have recognized this thing. Uh, and it docked, of all places, in Ghana. Uh, some of the hedge funds suing Argentina uh, had persuaded a Ghanaian judge to issue an attachment order over the vessel. Uh, it took several months for it to get released, but that's the level of creativity that they were exercising in looking for uh, Argentine assets. And they did not manage to recover anything. All of the cases that had been brought against Argentina in respect of this default, and there were hundreds, were centralized in the Southern District of New York before a single judge, Judge Thomas P. Grisey, a judge that even when this process began had senior status. Uh, he is now well into his 80s. Uh, as a younger man, uh, he was not known for the sweetness of his disposition. Uh, it, I think, has not improved as the decades have rolled sweetly on. Initially, he was quite sympathetic to the Argentines and would not allow the holdout creditors to derail their restructuring. But once the restructuring occurred, it was his view that he was handing down judgments against the Argentine Republic and that they ought to be, uh, if not paying the judgments, at least settling them. Uh, and of course, it came up directly against the lock law which the Argentines said forbid us from even commencing such a negotiation. I think it's fair to say that the good judge was looking for some leverage uh, that would induce the Argentines to settle these claims. He found it in an argument that uh, some of the hedge funds had put in front of him in 2011. They said more or less this. Your Honor, we've been rereading our bonds. We find in the bonds a particularly obscure clause known as the pari passu clause. Pari passu, Latin for in equal step, so equally. And the clause is very simple. Clause says, these bonds rank and shall rank pari passu equally with all of Argentina's other indebtedness. And the plaintiffs argued to Judge Grisey, and he accepted, that the promise to maintain the equal ranking of debt senior subordinated, connoted an undertaking to pay equally ranking debt on a rateable basis. It doesn't say that. It says, I promise to maintain the ranking. Uh, but he was persuaded that a promise to maintain the ranking should be interpreted as a promise to pay equally ranking debt rateably. So he said, uh, if you, Argentina, wish to make payments, to the bondholders who accepted your restructuring, parentheses, and who took a 75% haircut in doing so, close parentheses, you must make a rateable payment to the holdout creditors, and they've accelerated their bonds, so you must pay them off in full. Uh, the result was uh, that uh, Argentina felt obliged to default on the bonds that had issued to the creditors who participated in their restructuring. There was a, an election uh, last year in December. A new government in 
Argentina takes over, Mauricio Macri. Uh, his view was that this entire affair needs to be settled. Uh, and the uh, conclusion was that there were settlements reached with the vast majority of holdout creditors. I think it's fair to say the settlements were generous. Um, it left a couple of legacies. First, for the first time in 40 years, holdout creditors had fashioned, I won't say they discovered, because they didn't discover it, they fashioned it, a weapon uh, that could be used not just against the sovereign debtor, but could be used against the other creditors, the well-intentioned creditors, the one that took the deal, because it was their ox that was gored by this process. Moreover, they had fashioned a weapon uh, that was proven to be effective against even a sovereign debtor like Argentina uh, that had utterly uh, uh, renounced any intention of paying holdout creditors and resulted in generous recoveries, to be sure, 15 years after the fact. Uh, but it was a big payday uh, when it came. So the question now is, how will this affect the, the future sovereign debt restructurings, which we will surely face? Any sovereign restructuring US dollar bonds governed by New York law is now going to confront this question of whether uh, the existence of a pari passu clause in their bonds, and they are ubiquitous, those clauses, uh, means uh, that any holdout creditor can intercept, interfere with payments even to those creditors who accept the deal. No creditor in a future sovereign debt restructuring, of course, is going to accept that risk. Uh, a creditor who says, yes, I'm with you in your restructuring. I'll give you the debt relief you need, but I'm not going to take a piece of paper uh, at a discount, uh, give up my claim against you, only to find that my fellow creditor, now a holdout, that that son of a bishop uh, is not prepared to give you debt relief. That's bad enough. Uh, but he is now going to ensure that I can't get paid either. No creditor is going to accept that. Therefore, uh, as they say in Starfleet, the prime directive uh, for future sovereign debt restructurings under New York law is going to be to figure out a way to neutralize this pari passu threat. Before I tell you how it will be neutralized, I should share this with you. It was, from the beginning, a fallacy. Uh, the pari passu clause was never intended uh, to promise uh, rateable payments of equally ranking debt. Uh, and as a matter of fact, for 40 years, there was an unbroken precedent showing that that was not the intention of the clause. For ev in every sovereign debt restructuring we have done in 40 years, uh, some creditors get paid, the IMF, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, trade creditors often get paid, others get restructured, banks and bondholders, in 40 years. Uh, no one had ever suggested that the Pari Passu Clause was a break, uh, was an inhibition on that practice. In fact, uh, the clause originated uh, back in the late 1970s, uh, I believe in a loan agreement with the Republic of the Philippines, uh, in which the banks at the very last moment before they lent the money had asked their local council uh, about the ranking of the debt and were 
told that there is an obscure provision in the Philippine Civil Code which permits a creditor to take his debt instrument to a particular notary, pay a fee, get it notarized, and the legal effect of the notarization is to render that debt instrument senior to any unnotarized debt instrument, or for that matter, any subsequently notarized debt instrument. You see, this is not possible in our law. You cannot involuntarily subordinate a creditor. Uh, none of the banks had been lending with even a thought that it was possible uh, involuntarily to subordinate a creditor. Uh, and they discovered to their horror that, in fact, here's one country, at least, where it is possible. They had no idea uh, whether it existed in other countries, parentheses, it existed in a few, and, and those uh, uh, that had derived the provision from the Spanish Civil Code, but they weren't sure of that. And the way they protected themselves against it was to get first a representation. This debt ranks equally with all of your other senior debt, and then a covenant. This debt shall rank equally with your senior indebtedness. That's how they solved the problem. Uh, they never thought for a moment uh, that they were writing a provision which said, and you will pay all of those debts rateably. Had they intended that, <laughs> it, it's childishly easy to write those few words to say, and you will pay them uh, on a rateable basis. They never intended that. Um, anyways, so that's a footnote. It was a fallacy, but it was for the moment uh, in Judge Grisey's courtroom a convenient uh, theory uh, to provide uh, leverage uh, that resulted in the result that the judge had always wanted, which was a settlement of these claims. Can I, can I just interrupt a moment? You yeah. said that there wasn't an involuntary subordination, but in the Chrysler and the, uh, the uh, General Motors bankruptcy, uh, senior debt was in subordinated. Yes. Was subordinated involuntarily with it, the heavy hand of the government. Indeed. In, in bankruptcy, yes. In bankruptcy, uh, in a corporate bankruptcy, yes, all of those things are possible. Uh, but outside of bankruptcy, okay, okay. I, I can't, I if I owe each of you $100, I can't promise him that he ranks senior to you and have it stick. If I go bankrupt and you're general unsecured creditors, you each have a claim against me. Yeah. Uh, The, the, the injunction was worded very broadly, uh, not only to stop Argentina, but to stop any financial institution involved, and including Argentina's lawyers uh, from, or anyone else, from aiding or abetting a circumvention of the injunction. While it might be theoretically possible to arrange your payment streams so far offshore, the United States, that uh, even an aggressive judge sitting in the Southern District wouldn't be able to reach them. It won't be easy. You would have to find a trustee, a paying agent, uh, who not only didn't have an office in the United States, but never wanted to have an office in the United States. You would have to find advisors who would help structure this, uh, who had no office in the United <coughs> States, and therefore would not be liable for aiding and abetting. Uh, it is possible, but I think very difficult for a major sovereign debt restructuring to do that. So, yes, ma'am. Boney's problem rested in their name, the Bank of New York. <laughs> uh, and therefore, they were fat, wide, and happy uh, in terms of jurisdiction for, for Judge Brisset. So how might it be uh, resolved? I can think of 
a few ways. The easiest way uh, would be to, in the context of the debt restructuring, solicit the consent of those who are holding the debt to amend the bonds that they're giving up in an exchange offer um, to remove in its entirety the Paris Passu clause. In many bonds, such an amendment could be effected with only 50 or 66 and two thirds percent of the creditors. So one could, one could remove the Paris Passu clause altogether. Many sovereign bonds these days, unlike the ones involved in the Argentine case, contain a provision known as a collective action clause. It is a provision which says that if a specified supermajority of the holders of this instrument, typically 75%, agree to restructure it, that decision binds any dissenting minority. Those clauses have been enhanced in the last couple of years to replicate the class voting mechanism you would find in a corporate insolvency. So it isn't a bond by bond vote, uh, which always had the weakness that in a small bond trading at a dis discount following the distress of the sovereign, an investor could, for a modest amount of money, buy a blocking position by 26%. Uh, and one has arithmetic certainty that a collective action clause could not be used to cram down. So we have amended the collective action clauses so that they now apply across the entire uh, universe of bond indebtedness, meaning you would have to buy 25% of an entire debt stock to get a blocking position. Unfortunately, uh, those improved collective action clauses are only now beginning to filter into the debt stocks of these countries, it will take a decade before existing bonds mature and are replaced by them. Every priority pasu clause promises equal ranking with something. That something can be the sovereign's external debt, uh, it can be debt, it can be obligations, it can be uh, foreign currency obligations. Conceivably, you could try to do a debt restructuring in which you issued a piece of paper, let's call it a local currency instrument, uh, that the local central bank immediately agreed to swap for foreign currency on each payment date and avoid the pari passu risk that way. The final way that uh, I think might be possible is all sovereign debt restructurings, all exchange offers that have been done to date in the sovereign context have resulted in the issuance of new debt instruments. Existing holders turn in their old ones and those old ones are canceled. Uh, why? Uh, because uh, the sovereign doesn't want to double its debt stock. It wouldn't deliberately leave them alive. Um, but you could leave them alive. You could place them in the hands of a trustee you could say to the trustee, the old instruments that we took back do not accelerate, do not enforce, just hold them. And if a holdout creditor gets a pari passu injunction requiring us to pay rateably the holdout and the new bonds we've just issued, we won't pay the new bonds. We'll pay the old bonds. Uh, the old bonds have been pledged to secure the new instruments, and therefore you'll get your payment in full, participating creditor. Uh, the holdout creditor will get a partial payment, because after all, they're asking for the full 100 cents on the dollar. So they'll get a partial payment. And that result uh, could, I think, uh, avoid a situation in which the participating creditors are victimized uh, by the holdout. Uh, I, I called it the cryonic solution, cryonics being the science of freezing human body parts in the expectation that they can be unfrozen later uh, when the disease uh, has been cured. There is one recent development 
that may bear upon this, um, I think Judge Grise knew exactly what he was doing in the original Arepa Sioux orders. Uh, and there, despite the settlement with most of the holdout creditors, there was another case brought um, after the settlements had taken place in which a creditor alleged uh, not only was Argentina paying its other bondholders, it was settling with the other holdout creditors and not offering to make a rateable payment to them. And it gave Judge Grisey an opportunity to articulate what I think was the rule all along. What he said was, uh, Argentina did not violate the negative pledge clause, so, sorry, the Paripa Sioux clause by making a payment to one creditor and not making a rateable payment to another. He said they did that, uh, but they went on to do things like pass the lock law, hmm? which he interpreted as, in effect, a legislative subordination uh, of the holdout creditors. And therefore, he said very clearly on December 22nd of last year, uh, merely paying one creditor and not paying the other is not a pari passu violation. This from the judge uh, who uh, initially unleashed uh, this theory. Um, and so the lesson, I suspect, going forward is uh, no other sovereign uh, will ever do anything as breathtakingly foolish as pass a lock law. Mm -hmm. You may do whatever you want by way of practice in making payments to some creditors but not another, but don't try to legitimize it by passing legislation. And that, I suspect, may be the lesson. Let me turn it over here. And thank you, Lee. And thank you all for, for coming. Um, so I'll talk briefly about some recent research that I've conducted, which is joint with Jesse Schrager, formerly of HBS and, and now soon to be at Columbia Business School. And the paper is entitled, the, the Cost of Sovereign Default Evidence from Argentina. And so the circumstances that Lee is talking about generated an interesting experiment from the perspective of financial economists. So Judge Grisey, when he was reinterpreting the meaning of the pari passu clause, generated what an economist would like to call a shock to the markets. That is in his original ruling at the end of 2011, and then in several subsequent rulings, he did something that the markets did not anticipate, which is he effectively confronted Argentina with a choice to either pay the holdout hedge funds and continue to pay the restructured bondholders or to pay no one anything. The ex ante status quo of paying the restructured bondholders without paying the holdouts became infeasible. They had to pay everyone or pay no one. Now, by confronting Argentina with this choice, it isn't immediately obvious whether this would make Argentina more likely to pay everyone or pay no one. So some of the context that Lee gave us was about this sort of 10-year acrimonious battle between these holdout creditors and Argentina, the lock law and all of that. And as part of what was going on at the time, the Argentine political situation involved a ruling party that, in part, gained some popularity by demonizing these holdout creditors and blaming them for many of the economic problems that beset Argentina. Having done that, the holdout party, would, uh, the, the, par the ruling party rather, would find it very difficult to then turn around and settle with the holdouts, that is to say, to pay everyone. As Lee mentioned, it took an election and a new ruling party for Argentina to eventually decide to settle. So when Judge Grisey released his rulings, and when those rulings were not surprisingly overturned in the Second Court of Appeals. And then, in another shock, when that was not overturned at the Supreme Court level, 
What happened when Judge Grisset ruled against Argentina was that the prices of Argentine bonds in financial markets fell. And related to that, a financial instrument called a credit default swap, which is a way of betting on whether Argentina would default or not, indicated that Argentina became more likely to default. So from an economist's perspective, we can think of the releases of these real legal rulings, most of which went against Argentina, but a few of which went in Argentina's favor, as shocks that move the probability of Argentina defaulting up or down. Now, why might we be interested in that? Well, it turns out there's been a problem vexing economists for 30-some years, which is that we don't know why any government ever pays back any money. The advantages that governments have at the negotiating table that Lee was talking about lead for economists to a deep puzzle. If these judgments cannot be enforced, if there are no consequences of not paying anyone back, why doesn't every government default? And anticipating that, why would anyone ever lend a government, especially a government like Argentina, money? So what have we figured out? Well, in some groundbreaking research by uh, Jeremy Bulow, who is also at the Graduate School of Business here at Stanford, we figured out that there must be something else. That is that something bad must happen to a country when it defaults that more than offsets the good of not paying back the money. But what is that something? We don't know. How big is it? We don't know. These shocks gave us a way of figuring that out. Because what we normally see is that countries that default are not doing well. Most of the time, debt ceiling debacle in the United States aside, countries do not come close to defaulting if they're you know, economically successful. A typical defaulting country these days is a country like Venezuela, which is in dire economic straits right now. Or a country like the Ukraine, which is involved in a conflict and in dire economic straits. Or uh, you know, a, a, a situation like Puerto Rico, which again involves a sort of dire economic situation. But we usually don't know. Is the country defaulting because the economic situation is bad? Or does the default make the economic situation worse? We don't really have any way to tell. But in the case of Argentina, we had these shocks that Judge Grisey created for us that raised the probability of default in a way that is not at all related to the economic circumstances of Argentina. Judge Grisey, when he's thinking in his chambers, thinking about his order and then releasing it, does not know or care about Argentine GDP. So these shocks are, to use the economist term, exogenous to the situation in Argentina. So how will we measure these shocks? We see in financial markets, at a daily level, the default probability of Argentina going up and going down. We also see stock prices for Argentine firms going up and going down. And very conveniently for our purposes, these are not exactly the kind of stocks that you would typically buy in the US. They're what are called ADRs, American Depository Receipts. And what that means is that a company in Argentina has promised to pay dollars to a US investor. So when we see the dollar stock price of a company in Argentina go down, when the default probability for the government of Argentina going, goes up, we can know that the real value of this company is going down. It isn't some effect about currencies or anything like that that's confusing us. And this is, in fact, exactly what we find. Roughly speaking, when the probability of Argentina defaulting on its restructured bondholders goes up by 10%, the value of the firms in Argentina that we can observe falls by about 6%. Now, this is an enormous magnitude. It's so large, in fact, that we estimate that the value of the fall of the stock prices of Argentine firms 
was larger, substantially, than the entire amount that the government of Argentina eventually paid to settle these claims. That is, if there was some costless and magical way of moving money from these Argentine firms to the Argentine government and then on to the holdout creditors, everyone could have been better off if instead of this whole default thing, the Argentine firms just paid for the settlement. But that obviously is not what happened. And so we'd like to understand why. So, so far, everything that I've told you, I feel I can strongly back up. It's in the paper. I will defend it. I'm now going to sort of move into a more speculative mode. Why is it that the value of these Argentine firms could fall so much to the point where we have a failure of what economists call the Coase theorem? That is, these Argentine firms would have gladly paid for the government not to do this default and yet the government did it anyways. And the answer, I think, lies in a problem that is inherent to all defaulting emerging market sovereigns, which is that there's a reason they ran up that debt in the first place, which is that they really wanted to spend some money. And then there's also a reason that they needed to do that by borrowing, which is that they couldn't tax more. We saw this in Greece. We're seeing it now in Venezuela. When countries get into situations where they are borrowing a lot and then eventually defaulting, it is because, in part, they lack the ability to collect a lot of taxes. Now, all taxes aren't equal. There's sort of the easy taxes to collect, and you do those first. And then if you want more money as a government, you start you know, having to do some harder taxes, taxes that cause more problems. Eventually, you're doing things that do serious long-term damage to the economy. You're seizing assets. You're doing expropriations, like the Argentine expropriation of YPF. These kinds of things have long-term consequences. And so if you ask me, why were these firms harmed so much by the increased likelihood of Argentina defaulting, the answer is that these firms were at risk because Argentina's default would prevent them from raising money in the future through the debt markets of having their assets heavily taxed or expropriated. And so consistent with that interpretation, we find that if you are an exporter in Argentina who generates dollars, or if you are an Argentine firm which is a subsidiary owned by foreigners, your stock values fall by a particularly large amount consistent with the idea that these firms are, A, uniquely vulnerable to expropriation, either because they are politically disfavored, in the case of the subsidiaries, or because they have a lot of dollars sitting around, in the case of the exporters. And for this reason, those are the firms that are particularly harmed. So the last thing I'll say, sort of before I conclude and we take questions, is that you might ask, what can we learn from this Argentine episode about the situation in Puerto Rico or the situation in Venezuela? So for those of you who are not familiar with it, in Puerto Rico, um, Puerto Rico has a confusing relationship with the US. But the most salient point from our perspective is that because of a recent act of Congress, it is eligible for a form of bankruptcy protection. And so because of that, when it settles with its creditors through this bankruptcy mechanism, I would not anticipate that the future government of Puerto Rico will need to raise more money by heavily raising taxes or stealing assets or anything like that. And consequently, I would not necessarily predict an economic calamity for Puerto Rico. But now let's turn to Venezuela. In Venezuela, the economic calamity has largely already happened. And it has happened in part because of the government's desperate need to maintain its support by spending money, its inability, at least for a while, to borrow in the debt markets, and the fact that it has turned, because it could not borrow in the debt markets, to expropriation and other types of things. So, you may have heard recently that General Motors had a factory in Venezuela that was seized by the government. 
My prediction, if Venezuela defaults in the near future, which seems quite possible, is that if the current government remains in power, they will become even more desperate for money, resort to even more heavy-handed taxation and expropriation, and this will cause large economic harms, at least based on the sort of shadows of that possibility that I see in financial market data from the Argentine episode. So thank you very much, and I think we'll now open it to questions. So if you can go in the microphone, your case. You said that in your research, you came to one conclusion that in most of the cases, the defaults were due to inability to collect taxes, partially. I'm not saying that I was all your research. Before, we were talking that one of the big reasons for emerging markets to default in their debt was commodity prices. We all know the emerging markets, most of them, their economies are purely related to the commodities. So when you talk about Venezuela, Argentina, collecting taxes is basically trade and commodity finance, okay? Exporters being able to export high commodity prices and collect ta taxes. All other taxes are less significant for those countries. So have you gone into that depth in your research to specify what because collecting taxes sounds a little bit too broad? I think I will narrow it to specifically the trade balance and how the commodity prices affect these countries. Uh, so, that, so that's a great point. So when I was referring to easy taxes to collect, one of the things I had in mind in the case of Argentina is taxes on agricultural and commodity exports. And there are various reasons why, and this was actually also true historically in the United States at the beginning of our country, that governments that are institutionally weak for various reasons find commodity taxes to be one of the easiest kinds of taxes to collect. And so the commodity cycle that Lee was referring to, the large boom in commodity prices um, for most of the 2000s, buoyed Argentina and other countries' finances during that time. The subsequent uh, low growth and maybe slight decline in certain commodity prices is part of the reason why they would want to borrow more in the future um, and the fact that, at least un until uh, the settlement, they would have been unable to do so uh, would be a problem for them. I don't know if Lee has anything to add. Yeah, no. Um, it isn't just a question of collecting taxes. There's got to be a political will to impose the taxes. And that is, in all countries at all times, unpopular for politicians who wish to be reelected. Uh, it is frankly, the political distaste for taxation or for cutting expenditures, which leads inexorably to covering chronic budget deficits by borrowing. Uh, that's where so many of our countries uh, find themselves right now. Um, I said at the outset that I think we will see a resurgence in sovereign debt workouts in this century, early in this century. <clears throat> it is not just commodity prices. Uh, if you look across the globe today, you will find debt stocks that are typically significantly higher than they were at the beginning of the uh, financial crisis in 2008. In 2008, average debt to GDP in Europe, for example, was about 60%. Today, it's about 95%. This country, the land of the free and the home of the brave, uh, had a debt stock of around 9 trillion in 2008 and close to 20 trillion uh, today. Why is that not in the headlines? Uh, for the simple reason that the world's large central banks have been operating a zero interest rate policy for this entire time. Uh, so the cost of servicing a debt stock that can be significantly larger than what it was eight or nine years ago 
is actually less than what it was eight or nine years ago. But if you wish to lose sleep, uh, pro forma, your favorite country, uh, at the historic interest rate uh, paid by that country. In Europe, that would be between 5 and 6 percent. Uh, here, probably 4 to 5. Uh, do that, and you will see that servicing of these colossal debt stocks uh, would drain resources from virtually every other government purpose uh, to the point that uh, you will either have uh, uh, significant sovereign debt restructurings uh, or significant social unrest. Uh, thank you. I, I would certainly share your view on the likelihood of, of future uh, debt restructurings. We know that we've been through these cycles going back to the 19th century of borrow and default, borrow and default, borrow and default, borrow and default. And yet we're there seems to be no real progress, apart from the fact that we no longer use the U.S. Navy to collect. Um, but we are seeing spreads that don't make any sense. This, this cannot reflect a, a true expected value of the investments. There are things that are going on in the markets that, that make no sense. And you know, when we look at research where we're using market pricing in order to draw conclusions about valuations of things, it makes me nervous. Um, and I, I just welcome comment from either of you on, on, you know, how you see the pricing and the prospects and the disconnect between them. Thanks. Certainly. So. Obviously, as a financial economist, I am predisposed to ask questions like, how did Argentina's actions change the market value of the firms? But as you say, if the market is not perceiving correctly the value of these firms, or if it's not perceiving correctly the probability of Argentina defaulting, then the inferences that we make from market prices will not be correct. Now, on the other hand, the market has a, a funny way of looking at things. They, at least with respect to sovereign defaults, appear to overestimate the probability, at least if one were risk neutral, to use the finance jargon, that is, completely willing to tolerate the possibility of being defaulted upon. And in fact, historically, one of the things that we've observed is that sovereign debt investors tend to do very well, even when uh, more so than we would expect. And moreover, that there's a, a second puzzle, which I will tell you about but not resolve, uh, which is that the spreads on debt from, say, Argentina and the Philippines and the Ukraine somehow seem to move together in ways that we have trouble explaining. So there are lots of things that we can't explain about the market. That said, um, I tend to be hesitant to substitute my own judgment in the place of the market, and I certainly wouldn't, from my perspective, forecast that everyone buying sovereign debt today will lose money. I agree with you entirely. No sober historian of sovereign debt would think that the spreads that the market has been charging are remotely commensurate with the risk that uh, some of these sovereigns are posing. How to explain it, I think, Part of it is uh, simple liquidity. There is so much money sloshing around, particularly after lashings of quantitative easing in various places, uh, that money has got to go somewhere. Uh, second, there was at least a plausible case in a time of very high commodity prices that some of these countries were bankable. But I think there's another factor, and the other factor is that if you look at experiences such as the Eurozone debt crisis that started in 2010, uh, with the sole and belated exception of the Greek debt restructuring in 2012, all of those other countries were completely bailed out by official sector money. IMF and EU money was lent to the countries, Portugal, Ireland, Cyprus, Greece until 2012, and most of it simply bled through to repay in full and on time the private sector bondholders. Uh, that was a decision taken by the official sector, I think, 
because they feared contagion. They feared a situation in which the market would say, if you can restructure the debt of uh, Ireland or Portugal, might you be able to restructure the debt of Italy or Spain or La Belle France? And might not that uh, contagion bring upon the whole of Europe a financial conflagration? And they were prepared effectively to monetize every debt instrument south of the River Rhine in order to avoid that. Thanks, great presentations. Uh, ben, as I listen to your um, explanation of, uh, of uh, why a, a sovereign might not wish to default and then um, have it revealed, as you said, in the case of Argentina, it strikes me that it applies even more generally uh, than in the case of a country uh, which is on hard economic times and has to reach for ever harder to get taxes that are ever more costly. In fact, it would seem to apply to a country that's an emerging market economy that's doing exceptionally well, growing very rapidly, and uh, the opportunity to get capital from abroad would be necessary because of the um, shortage of investment capital domestically and the threat of not being able to continue to get capital abroad would be sufficiently severe uh, to cause it to wish to pay off its debt. Am I correct in, that, in, in, in that, that your that your um, explanation actually applies quite quite more generally? Well, so I think the thing that I would emphasize is that the we should think of the sovereign and the local firms and households as separate entities, and. The notion, which goes back, again, as I mentioned, to Jeremy Bulow and, and his co-author uh, at the GSB, that uh, reputation alone is sufficient to avoid, uh, is, is not sufficient, rather, to um, induce repayment, which is a very sort of famous result, um, is based in part on this notion that the sovereign and the households and the firms in that country can be thought of as a consolidated entity. But once you start thinking about conflict between the households, the firms, and the government, uh, then I think exactly, uh, Daryl, as you're saying, that um, reputation in a certain respect becomes more powerful and that it may, in, on some occasions, but not others, be sufficient to induce uh, repayment. But that's speculation, I should say, rather than a firm result. My perception of it is that when a sovereign is in default, uh, there is always a risk that it will use its sovereign power to impose a capital control and suck up from the corporate sector uh, the foreign exchange that they're earning. Uh, what it means, in Ben's uh, 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 view, uh, is that those companies will find it much harder to borrow money abroad uh, because they're always at risk that their foreign currency earnings, however solvent they may be, uh, will simply be uh, uh, sucked up by the local central bank. So that if you look at the history of sovereign debt workouts, uh, entities like Pemex, the Mexican oil company, which is hugely solvent, uh, nonetheless had to restructure uh, their debt uh, because the government simply said, uh, your foreign exchange is now expropriated, I guess is, is the right word. Uh, so when I got my MBA, I, uh, my uncles invited me back to my Eastern European uh, neighborhood in Detroit, and I think I probably was the first guy to graduate from college, maybe the first guy to graduate from high school. But, uh, you know, they gave me a big party and stuff like that. And uh, then, you know, all the neighbors would come over because I was going to spend the whole summer there, and they'd, they'd invite me over to their house, and they'd open their cedar chest or some closet, and 
they'd show me some of these bonds that they had bought or their their parents had bought in the 1920s. They were like, you know, from places like uh, the old uh, Austria-Hungary Empire that had come in, you know, Czechoslovakia and Hungary. And of course, all these guys are under communist uh, rule now. So they'd always ask me if I could get some value for them. So, you know, you could look in the, the New York bond exchange and you'd see them selling a couple cents on a dollar. But essentially, they are worthless. So, you know, I mean, even the, even the Orthodox priest had bought some. So, you know, God didn't help him, I guess. But, you know, that's just the way it was. And I'm saying, so these people were just poor guys. They were just working class people. So I can see why they bought them. You know, country pride and stuff. 1920s, there's lots of money around. But I guess today, I say, why can they still sell these? You know, I mean, those were a different case. All those people lost money, but they lost it slowly. You know, they didn't lose it. They didn't even know they lost it, quite frankly. But uh, today, how can they keep selling these for all these countries? You know, you see uh, Crete going bad or Cyprus or, you know, Greece. I mean, my grandparents were Greek Orthodox, so I hope I'm not bad mouthing them too much. But, you know, those poor guys, you know, let them go back to the Drotma. Let the Italians go back to the Lyra. Let them print and, and have a nice time. I mean, these poor bastards are just in, they're just, they're just living a terrible life because they took the Euro. Let them, let them do what they used to. You know, you go to Europe and the Lyra was $500. The next year you go back, it's 600 to a dollar. And the next year, 700 And everything was fine, you know. But now this is just not the right world, you know. Let them print their own currency. Let those poor bastards in the in ethnics that come to the United States got some money, buy it, and let the let them go on that way. But but this euro thing is just killing a lot of these people because they clearly it's not in their nature to be disciplined. So I don't know if you have any question to that, or maybe I didn't ask a question at all. Well, I can, I can give you the legal answer and let Ben yeah. Ben give you the real answer. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was 41 years ago, and only 41 years ago in this country, that we passed a law called the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. For the first time, uh, this country recognized a theory of sovereign immunity which said that when a sovereign goes into the international commercial marketplace and behaves as a commercial actor, it will be held accountable in court as though it were a commercial actor. Before that, 1976, um, virtually every country in the world recognized a theory of absolute sovereign immunity. You could not sue a foreign sovereign without its consent. So all of those bonds issued in the 1930s, the 1920s, and every bond before that uh, was, to use a phrase of an English judge in the 19th century, an engagement of honor. It was not a legally enforceable contract. And this is what has changed legally, that starting in 1976, every one of these creditors is holding a legal, valid, binding, and enforceable piece of paper, entitling them to get a judgment, as they did in Argentina, entitling them to persuade uh, a judge like Judge Grisey to give them a remedy and to cause unholy heck. And that's the big difference between then and now. Hey, I guess I'll pick up on a different thing uh, that, that you were talking about that is related to what, what Lee was saying, which is um, this issue of Italy and why, um, you know, how it used to be that the lira was constantly uh, devaluing. Now they're on the euro and their economy is not doing so well. The thing that I would say, and this, this held doubly true for Argentina, is that going to a dollarized economy or a fixed exchange rate or joining the Eurozone does not cure a government of the desire to spend more than it raises in tax revenue. And as long as, as Lee was saying, as long as the government has that desire to spend more than it earns, it will need to borrow. And if it continues to spend more than it earns and continues to borrow, eventually it will run into trouble. And no amount of uh, technical manipulation of how the currency system works will, will hide that, that underlying reality. Maybe we have time for one more. Yeah, I guess it's the last question. Thank you. 
being a lay person without any business or legal formal training and with respect to all of the craziness and stupidity going on in the financial markets nowadays, my single interest is to find out if a sovereign can set up a sovereign fund and specifically say that it cannot be used to collateralize any debt of any sort, such as uh, perhaps like a fund to pay out a guaranteed income, a basic income to its citizens. Is that fund safe from any of this um, yeah. You, well, you know what I'm trying to say. Such funds exist. They're quite popular now. They're called sovereign wealth funds. Typically, uh, they are set up by commodity exporters who say that uh, a certain percentage of the income that the country is earning from the sale of a commodity above a base price will go into a fund, uh, to use the Kuwaiti expression, for future generations because in Kuwait's case, oil will run out one day. And so this is the, the problem with it is they are creatures, obviously, of their local law. Uh, so the politicians will set them up. And everyone I've ever seen, the politicians say, we will keep our cotton picking hands off the fund. We will not invade the fund to cover budget deficits uh, or to, in your case, assist future borrowings. Uh, but the political flesh is notoriously weak. Uh, and it would only take another uh, group of politicians to come in and say that the, there's some national emergency that requires us to, to dip into the fund. So they have a checkered history uh, politically. 